Thank you so much. It is uh, such a pleasure to be here today. I wish to thank the uh, Temple of Consciousness and its, uh, all its leaders for our gracious invitation and uh, Jay Prakash for inviting me to this particular session. And uh, it's just such a divine place. The meditations that we are experiencing really add to the quality of this meeting in a mo most unexpected way. So beautiful. Yesterday we had a meditation and I am sure I was completely in delta waves, uh, floating away, not a thought in my head. So beautiful. With these words, what I'm really saying is that I hope that this temple might be the place where East and West meet. And it will be a challenge. Thank you. It will be a challenge, but let us meet and uh, grow uh, with this challenge and uh, make our language come together, make our terminology work better together, and make our understanding uh, deeper together. I will today try to convey to you that there are molecular mechanisms worthy of study that relate to spirituality. And so the question, uh, do genes determine our faith? Um, I will already now say yes, there is such an important component there. I also want to give tribute to my colleague, Professor Romero Valada from Brazil, who, uh, together with whom I have studied the area of spirituality for some years in a Brazilian cohort. And he has uh, contributed with some of the um, ideas for this talk. So this year, uh, it is 70 years since the structure and content of DNA was discovered. 70 years is a very short time. This means that this is a very young science. You see the picture of Watson and Crick uh, at their discovery, although others participated, for sure. Um, today, we are living in the world of the Human Genome Project, where the whole map has been made of the human genome. But again, it's only 20 years old. So it's a very recent science, and there is a lot we do not know. What we do know is that there is variation between human beings and you can see how different people are and you know it but it's all about 0.1% of the genetic code that make us different. The rest is really the same. So the overwhelming message here is that we are the same and that the differences are really small. I think Having said this about DNA and the molecular science being very young, we also have to consider what we are going to study. And that, of course, is the religiosity, spirituality. And we, we have to define what we as scientists, we would call it the phenotype. What is it that we are going to study, really? And I think it will be helpful for all the speakers of this conference that we can sort somehow identify, and I know and I apologize because for many of you in the room this is obvious, but for us as molecular scientists it's sometimes not obvious. Um, from a handbook that's about 20 years old, we can learn that religiosity is about how much an individual believes, um, and it can be sort of divided into organizational, which is when you really follow a practice very regularly, or the non-organizational thing, where you do things at home, maybe on your own terms. Both of those can be measured. Both of those can put, be put into scales. And Harold Koenig was one of those who has tried to define this in a good way. And he says that religion is an organized system of beliefs, practices, rituals, and so on symbols to facilitate approximation with the sacred, the transcendent. Again, 
this can be put into scales such that we can quantify it and we can study it. And that is needed if we are going to be able to correlate with molecular findings. Um, you can further divide it into the intrinsic or extrinsic part, um, and meaning that whether you make it a, a main goal of life, whether everything circles around the religiosity, or whether it's more utilitarian, where you have a means to an end, so that you, you have your life as regular, but the religion, the religious part supports your endeavors in life, as it were. And you can measure many things, the affiliation, the attendance, psychometric approaches, and evaluate then the, the intrinsic and extrinsic parts. Spirituality, on the other hand, uh, is more of a personal quest to understand the issues related to, you know, the purpose of life, its meaning, about the relations with the sacred or the transcendent, which, of course, may or may not then lead to religious practices or formations of religious communities. Uh, you can also have a very spiritual person and be that on your own, in your own belief system, which may or may not coincide with other people's belief systems. Having said that, I think that people who study this, they agree that there is no simple definition of spirituality that's accepted by all. So there is a challenge uh, when we study spirituality, which we have to acknowledge. However, uh, epidemiology uh, has taught us a lot, um, and this is the first step of the science. And what has really been instrumental is twin studies. In particular, if you have um, twins that are If you have twins that are uh, reared apart, um, you can make a difference between twins that are monozygotic, they come from one fertilized egg, or dizygotic, they come from two fertilized eggs. And uh, if you are monozygotic, you have 100% the same genetic material. If you are dizygotic, you have 50% that you share just like any siblings would, except that you are born at the same time with the same uh, environment in the uterus. So, uh, absolutely most important study, and the first study, was the Minnesota study of twins reared apart, which started some 50 years ago uh, by Thomas Bouchard. And lots of information went into this study, so it was a very careful study. And uh, one of the absolutely epic studies. And this is a study that is really, you know, I, I, I would call this study, um, this is in science, it's proven, it is real data. At the bottom, you see, using this type of scales that I talked about, the difference in correlation um, when it comes to monozygotic twins uh, reared apart and monozygotic twins reared together. So they have absolutely the same genetic material within them, uh, and you see the same correlation more or less whether they were reared apart or reared together. This means that the environment has a very small part uh, when it comes to the uh, sort of genetic, so the genetic component uh, dominates when it comes to psychological differences and indeed uh, religiosity that they use two scales to ascertain. So, so that was uh, quite mind blowing. There are several other twin studies that I don't have time to report in the interest of time. One of the earlier studies that uh, identified uh, genetic components uh, that affect um, things like self-transcendence and spiritual acceptance uh, was this paper actually from Sweden, uh, which was in 2007, a 
little bit before this um, thought gene that uh, Thomas was referring to before. And although it's not a strong publication, it shows two genetic components that can lead to, uh, if you have the more unusual variant, it can lead to a lower level of self-transcendence and spiritual acceptance. Um, and I would say that when it comes to single gene studies, uh, they have really don't dominate the field, and I think there, there is quite little data that we should, we should not get hung up on, on the single gene studies uh, anymore. Um, however, there is a field that has come to dominate the field of spirituality very much. And that came with the discovery of the mechanisms behind the end of the chromosomes that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2009 and discovered and it describes how chromosomes are protected by telomeres and the enzyme telomerase. And the telomeres then, they are small repeated sequences at the end of the chromosomes. And they protect them. And there is an enzyme that can rebuild them, so it's a dynamic process. At birth, you have 11,000 base pairs of this repeat at the end of each chromosome. Someone like me, who has passed 60, should have about 5 kilobase, although I actually have a little more. But um, um, it's sort of a cellular aging signal and highly heritable, which also is true for aging processes that are highly heritable. In fact, the short telomeres uh, activate programs of cell death, so they are quite important uh, in terms of survival of the cell and survival of the organism. Now, this curve describes what I already said, so I would be somewhere in the middle here, and uh, uh, as you can see, uh, it it is being uh, reduced, the telomere length gets reduced uh, all the way through life. Of course, uh, the idea here is that since this is a, a marker for aging, it is possible that keeping the telomeres longer in various ways might help you age more gracefully. However, I will point out to you that it is an association and it is not for sure that it is the telomere length itself that is the most important biological factor. It could be something that travels along with the length of the telomere. And I will show you some examples of that in this talk. So, people are so focused on the popular science of telomere length, but it doesn't have to be only telomere length. I'm making that point already now. So, religious involvement and telomere length, this is one of the first studies of caregivers of dementia patients in Los Angeles. And they found that um, there was a, a uh, positive relation to telomere length uh, and religiosity. So, the more re religious you are, the longer the telomeres are. Again, an association. Um, but um, another paper that is somewhat larger, uh, again, size matters in this kind of studies, where they looked at several different uh, scales, and, um, and here's the actual paper. In underlined in green, you see that um, here they found that uh, the, the positive association uh, between uh, religious attendance, prayer frequency, religious identity with uh, telomere length. Again, this is all measured in blood, remember. This is not the brain, but it's measured in blood. Um, here's another paper um, that, which is interesting because they followed people over time. So the first observation uh, was in 2004 and then the second observation four years later. 
and uh, although it's a, uh, it, it, and it's a, you know, 4,000 individuals plus, it's a fairly nice study, um, and they looked at stress, depressive symptoms, telomere size, and church attendance, etc. And here, the biggest association in green uh, was that there was a clear association between um, those that attended religious services and having fewer stressful life events, lower levels of smoking, fewer symptoms of depression. But there was not a direct correlation between the telomere length, it was an indirect correlation by reducing symptoms of depression and the risk of smoking. But, but, but there was no direct association in this study. So not every study has been positive. Here's a Chinese study, um, and again, uh, a good size sample where they measure uh, blood on telomere length and uh, depression scales and other scales. And uh, again, um, they had a negative correlation with depressive symptoms, which means that you have less depression if you have longer telomeres. Yeah, and uh, so depressive symptoms correlated and religiosity was positively correlated with telomere length in this study. So, um, here is a complex study with several different ethnic groups and dividing it between males and females. And what you can see is that it's not identical between males and females, and it's not identical between, in this case, three ethnic groups that they had uh, black, Hispanic, and non Hispanic white people. A relatively modest size study, but the point is that there will be ethnic differences and there will be sex differences in, in studying this. And I'm not going to go into uh, details of this study. However, having now shown you a number of studies that indicate that telomere lengths seem to be correlated, uh, the question is, what can we do about it? And there are many things we can do about it. I'm going to tell you over the next few slides um, what mechanisms are involved. Here is a pathway. This is a pathway that at the bottom of this slide on to the right that build the protection of the end of the chromosomes. The telomerase that elongate the telomeres. And there's a whole series of molecular machineries where um, in the middle of the slide to the left GSK3 beta in blue is considered a master switch. And this master switch, the only drug that is approved today in the pharmaceutical world to affect this master switch is lithium, which happens to be uh, my uh, favorite research topic when I talk about the science I normally do. Uh, but there are other ways to affect this pathway, and I'm going to discuss that with you. But let me point out that lithium is being used to treat bipolar disorder all across the world. It's been in use for 70 years. And here you see, in particular to the left, how uh, the black uh, columns, those that are being treated with lithium, uh, where compared to those that are not being treated with lithium, um, and they have significantly longer telomeres and this is interesting because bipolar disorder, of course, contains depression. And with depression comes shorter telomeres. So anyone would have expected that patients with bipolar disease would have shorter telomeres because they are suffering from depression and depression is known to reduce, it's very stressful with depression, it's known to reduce the length of the telomeres. In opposition, we found in this paper for about 10 years ago, that they have 35% longer telomeres compared to healthy controls. And that was an amazing founding, finding that set us off on a number of studies in animals and in humans that I don't have time to tell you about today. But I'll mention three studies. Uh, one up to the left is the published study from 10 years ago. To the right, we have a, an animal study 
looking at the rat model of depression and the advantage there is like Thomas was bringing up in the animals we can do things we can't do in uh, the humans. In this case we can study the brains and we find that the same telomere mechanisms are ongoing with lithium treatment in rats in this case. And at the bottom my student Martin Lundberg has studied the, the enzyme itself in humans and he finds that also the enzyme is activated uh, in uh, lithium treated bipolar patients so it is yeah, at a higher level than those not receiving lithium. So how does this play about? What is, the, what is the sort of context? I mentioned to you that it might not have to do only with telomere attrition down to the right. Well, telomere length interacts intimately with mitochondrial function, in particular complex one of the mitochondria, which is a very important complex for energy generation. And when you have a leaking complex one, that's when you have oxidative stress and, and the, the problems that come with oxidative stress. At the top, you have NRF2. And NRF2, the, the NRF2 complex, uh, is again a master switch in biology for aging. And uh, if you can activate NRF2, you counteract aging. And since NRF2 interacts with lithium and telomeres, it is possible that this triad of mechanisms all act together and that the truth about the biology we're seeing resides more in the NRF2 system or in the mitochondrial system. Talking about NRF2, here are recent papers, a whole series of them, about 10 that you see here on this slide. Look up to the left. It is about obesity and metabolic syndrome. Down to the left about Alzheimer. Up to the right about um, liver fibrosis about diabetes, and below that about cancer, and below that about periodontal disease. NRF2 is the, really the master switch that has been associated with all of these. So what can you do to activate NRF2? Well, here is what happens to any human being. We all uh, decline in our NRF2 system with age. Here is what goes on here at the Temple of Consciousness, at least in my experience over a couple of meals. You see curcumin, it was in the drink that we got after dinner yesterday. You see broccoli, you see tomatoes, you see coffee. All of these activate NRF2. Um, the two others, senolytic drugs, is a big, big discussion. And I challenge you, here at the temple, here in India, please find uh, drugs, or I would say plants, um, herbs, that can activate senolytic processes. That will be a wonderful way to keep you from aging. Because what has been turned out, there's a whole literature on this, what is important here is to remove the cells that are dying. We are populated, as we age, with more and more half-dead or more, mostly dead cells that we call senescent cells. They still reside in our body and they create a lot of problems. The more efficient we are at removing these cells, the better we will be in the aging process. And this is unexplored. There is really nothing that we can do today to influence this in a systematic manner, or at least we don't have the knowledge. Uh, but I challenge you to, to, uh, um, to work on this area, which so far is really unexplored. Um, lithium, uh, I should say, is the... Uh, it was actually one of the three first elements to be created after the Big, ba big Bang. Um, and it's super important for many, many purposes. Um, and here is a recent uh, paper from Cell, which is considered one of the, or perhaps the best scientific journal in the Western world, uh, where it's indicated that lithium uh, has been shown to extend the lifespan in organisms 
and that here it promotes longevity through GSK3 inhibition and subsequent NRF2 activation. So these two master switches is really where, if you believe in addressing longevity, these are the two master switches where Indian traditional medicine and Indian practices need to be targeting. And this is what we need to study if we're going to understand it. And I think this is, this is not hocus pocus or a theory, theory from somewhere, but th this is hardcore data. Personally, every morning starts uh, with some broccoli sprouts. This is the most well, th this is the best known or the strongest uh, activator of NRF2 that is known uh, currently. There might be better things, but uh, this actual bag was taken, uh, the photo is taken from my breakfast table. So th this is no joke. Um, and. Uh, that's why uh, I have been able to be at the Karolinska now for 65 years and I'm still very, you know, youthful. And there are actually studies about lithium and aging, several, there was about 20 studies in the literature. I'm just showing you a couple of them, both in animal models and in humans, that identify that with higher lithium in the groundwater, so these are very low levels of lithium, you actually have a longer lifespan and less homicides and suicides, which is something that should be addressed more. Uh, and we don't know so much about it yet, but these are much, much lower levels than we use for bipolar, maybe 100th of the level or 1,000th of the level, so much lower. And it still has an important uh, function, at least epidemiologically speaking. So, I finish here um, with my concluding remarks and these are that religiosity and spirituality are complex behaviors and not everyone agrees on what they are but uh, the, what is clear is that there is a strong genetic contribution to uh, both religiosity and spirituality. There are few uh, single gene findings that are believable, uh, but they point to the existence of specific effects in the genome. More importantly is what Thomas was talking about, is the epigenetics that again is a way of shaping the telomeres. And uh, telomeres correlate, telomere size correlates strongly with uh, RNS. Um, and as I told you, depression correlates with shorter telomeres, whereas lithium monotherapy is associated with markedly longer telomeres. And finally, the most important part perhaps, and the last part of my talk, telomere lengths can be influenced by spirituality, by lifestyle, by well-being, by food choices, uh, by lithium for sure, and uh, NRF2 activation. And all of those factors uh, in multiple studies influence lifespan. I highlight my uh, friends in uh, the groups where I have the honor to be an uh, integral part. To the left in the middle, I can't point to him, but he's in the uh, blue shirt, the Brazilian Homero Valada, uh, holding his arm again, again around an uh, an innovator in a light blue shirt. And that's Homer Valada, who has uh, been a friend, uh, collaborator, and contributor for many years. And to the right is the molecular cell biology group that I haven't talked so much about its work today, but we do a lot of work on stem cell biology uh, in the laboratory. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martin. You don't know, as you speak, the stock market in lithium batteries has grown up. <laughs> lithium is uh, what I refer to as dirt cheap. Uh, so um, it's a wonderful, uh, not only for making batteries, for, but also for enhancing the lifespan. And the, the big question, and I get this a lot, is so how much lithium should I take, doctor?
And we have an ongoing discussion about that. Because it's off patent, no drug company will invest in lithium. But I've managed to get the Swedish drug company actually invest some in lithium. And what I'm busy doing is enhancing the medical indications for lithium in Sweden. And if we get approved in Sweden, it will be all EU countries. And so that's an ongoing process to widen the indications for lithium. This is with the Swedish Food and Drug Agency. Uh, what I would really like to do is to do studies with low dose lithium and address other behavioral cognitive phenotypes. Um, and maybe, which is the most difficult thing, to address factors of longevity. Uh, but those studies, you have to have proxy markers because you cannot wait until everyone is dead in the study. Obviously, it takes a long time, um, but, 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 but it's, it's a challenge. But, but I, I believe that there is a lot to be done in the field. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, May I invite uh, our Dr. Rabindranath on the stage, please? And I'm sure that our scholars will be doing a study on the impact of Kaya Kalpa and taking a cup of broccoli every day on the lithium levels. Thank you, Dr. Martin.